very much uh, uh, for invitation to participate in this symposium. Alexander Pop and, uh, and the company Quantica, who made, uh, uh, to my mind, uh, a brilliant work. Uh, until now, all the lectures which I listened here, uh, they uh, impressed me a lot, and I got uh, myself a lot of new ideas and information during this uh, yesterday, and uh, of course, uh, after brilliant lecture of uh, Professor Belousov, it will be not so easy to present my material. Uh, second, I would like to, uh, to acknowledge also Fritz Albert Pop, without uh, whom there would be no this symposium, uh, I suppose, and uh, no uh, this event. And uh, I got acquainted together with uh, Professor Belousov, we got acquainted with Fritz Pop 20 years ago. And uh, I would like to say that uh, mm, uh, Fritz Pop, uh, uh, this uh, my uh, collaboration and uh, uh, my uh, knowledge of what uh, Fritz Pop was doing and my co uh, contacts during these years uh, changed uh, my world view. Uh, from uh, my background is faculty of biology, biophysics, uh, which is not physics of a life uh, until now, unfortunately, but physics of dead. We just uh, discussed this problem with Emilia Del Giudice. Uh, biochemistry, uh, the bioorganic chemistry. Uh, uh, my uh, world view before I met Fritz Pop uh, was uh, reductionary. Uh, so uh, I considered, as most biologists now, that when you cut living thing into many, many parts, and the tiniest are these parts, the more molecules you extract from a uh, living uh, organism, the better you will know how it behaves uh, as a living thing. And the whole biology now, until now, works in this direction. Uh, thanks to my acquaintance to, uh, to, uh, to Fritz uh, Pop, uh, I uh, changed uh, this worldview, and I see uh, would like uh, to uh, understand now uh, the world as a uh, holistic uh, entity uh, where the living state is the governing, the major entity. And uh, uh, I consider, I would like uh, just to finish this introduction uh, by this acknowledging that Fritz uh, Pop, uh, I consider him my, uh, one of my uh, most important uh, teachers. Okay, when I was invited to give a talk here at this uh, symposium for uh, many people who are not uh, uh, for, uh, with very different background, uh, I was thinking uh, what uh, topic uh, should be uh, um, considered here. And uh, it seemed to me, uh, I don't know if I'm correct, but it seems to me now that many people, uh, irrespective of their background, if they are scientists or not scientists and so on, are interested very much in what we call evolution now, especially. Why? Because uh, many people feel, some uh, understand, that the world now, that we live now, in the time of, uh, uh, um, of tremendous changes, that uh, we uh, already observe uh, 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 during our lifetime uh, tremendous changes. So uh, we see uh, uh, what, uh, uh, that uh, during these uh, several decades uh, time goes faster and faster. And uh, we begin to think what, uh, uh, where we are going, uh, what will uh, mm, uh, follow uh, with uh, the, uh, uh, after? Uh, is there any trends in this evolution uh, development uh, uh, which we observe uh, during these days, these uh, years, these uh, weeks? So this uh, uh, is uh, an important, not just scientific, but personal uh, problem, the problem of evolution. Uh, that's from one side. From the other side, uh, the uh, problem of evolution is the uh, most important uh, uh, biological problem, uh, because biology is historical science. Uh, you cannot uh, speak about living things, about living organisms, not taking into consideration that they are always changing, and they are changing during their lifetime, that is, uh, ontogenesis, and uh, life is changing uh, during, um, uh, 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 during uh, d decades, uh, centuries, millennia, and so on, and that is evolution. Without taking, not taking into consideration this historical uh, side of biology, we cannot speak uh, about uh, living. Uh, and uh, there is a very important question. Is in this uh, evolution any uh, laws 
or evolution is just uh, changes. So, and if there are laws, uh, what uh, is the substanti uh, substantiation of these laws? Uh, where from uh, these laws of uh, evolution emerge and how they are implemented? So that's why I decided to choose this uh, topic, evolution and water. Why water? Because water is also one of the most uh, important uh, substances uh, which uh, we become uh, uh, started to acknowledge importance of water, uh, uh, frankly speaking, only very recently. Okay, when we uh, uh, talk about something, uh, better to start from definition. And if you go to look at some thesaurus, on the, what, does, uh, what the word evolution means uh, to different people. It turns out that there are uh, different meanings of the word uh, evolution. First meaning of evolution is very simple. That's change over time. Uh, you can look at, uh, see it in thesaurus. And uh, biological, specifically biological evolution, are changes in genetic composition of a population during successive generations as a result of natural selection acting on the genetic variation among individuals and resulting in the development, or better to say not development here in this context, but appearance of new species. So that is just change over time. Very simple, uh, any change is uh, uh, evolution. But uh, if to look at the origin of the word evolution, from Latin evolutia, that means, uh, the wo this word, uh, in fact, means unfolding. It means development. It means change according to some program, and not just any change uh, uh, over time. So, uh, s another uh, meaning of the word evolution is a set of prescribed or programmed movements, and usually to a higher level. When we are talking about evolution, we usually consider that this evolution is development from more simple to more complex, from more uh, dissipative to more concentrative, uh, from less coherent to more coherent. That's what we mean uh, usually uh, when we use this word evolution, or which is synonym to the word development. And uh, uh, another uh, here and, and in this context, the uh, evolution is the process of a living system growing organically. A biological unfolding of ev events involved in, the, in, in an organism changing gradually from a simple to a more complex level. And the previous lecture of Professor Bel Belousov was a lecture about the embryological development. In this sense, you can uh, use the, uh, the, this uh, embryological or biological development you can use the word evolution of an uh, embryo. Okay, uh, so these are two meanings of the word evolution, and there are two major and alternative co uh, concepts of evolution of a living uh, matter. The first com uh, co uh, concept, uh, which is now dominating practically in all uh, biological, and not only biological, but in school education as well, that is neo-Darwinian concept which is uh, related to the first meaning of the word uh, evolution, just change over time. Uh, I will try to show you that this neo-Darwinian concept is, as a matter of fact, uh, 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 different from the original Darwin's theory of evolution. They are not uh, equal to each other. And uh, what we call the synthetic uh, uh, theory of evolution, which is stems from Darwin's theory, uh, it uh, is, from, from my point of view, is much, uh, it is not fruitful at all, unlike Darwin's original theory of evolution. So, uh, the first concept is neo-Darwinian concept, change over time, and the second concept is Lamarck concept, which is connected to the second uh, meaning of the word evolution, that is unfolding or development. So, Lamarckian concept of evolution is the law, evolution according to laws and evolution with the definite trends. Darwinian or neo-Darwinian concept of evolution is a trendless evolution. Better to say neo-Darwinian concept of evolution. Okay, let's start from the first, uh, which, uh, first uh, concept of evolution, uh, which uh, was first suggested uh, by uh, great biologist Charles Darwin in 1859. So, uh, evolution as change over time. So,
So uh, when uh, Darwin first published his uh, uh, famous book, The Origin of, Spe of Species, but I would like to, to tell you that uh, practically, uh, though this uh, book is considered to be uh, for many people no less important than Bible, uh, I would say, uh, but very few people uh, really read uh, this book uh, from uh, the beginning to the end, and most people uh, know about Darwinian theory of evolution from textbooks and digests uh, of this uh, theory of evolution. But so, uh, according to this Darwinian principle, natural selection, survival uh, of the fittest, living organisms are more or less passive objects whose activity is restricted to their desire to multiply. Why they are passive objects? Because they ch there is any change over time. Many things, they change over time. They, uh, the difference uh, of living things from non-living non things, according to this concept, is only that they can uh, their change over time can be inherited and transmitted to further and further generation. But in fact, they are uh, just passive because a beneficial chance variation in the progeny provides them with the ability to survive in a given uh, environmental uh, conditions. And evolution results in the survival of the fittest and elimination of the losers. In fact, many critics of uh, this uh, concept they say that it is a kind of tautology. Uh, why uh, those survive? Because they are fittest, fit. Why those don't survive? Because they don't uh, fit. So uh, survival of the fittest is a kind of tautology. It doesn't, in fact, explain anything. I mean the neo-Darwinian uh, concept of evolution. Okay, but uh, I uh, took uh, some uh, time ago, uh, the, uh, uh, like all the biology students, I studied uh, uh, in my courses the evolution theory, but we never read a Charles Darwin book. And uh, uh, some 15 years ago, I decided uh, to uh, reconsider uh, uh, this evolution. And I uh, uh, read The Origin of Species of Charles Darwin. And I found that Charles Darwin really suggested a scientific theory. What is a scientific, uh, real scientific theory? Scientific theory is usually based on, uh, on the restricted uh, quantity of uh, postulates or principles. So you just introduce several principles which uh, um, uh, considered to be self-obvious, and from these postulates, principles, axioms, you devise the uh, uh, consequence. You, uh, basing on these principles, you can uh, predict uh, some uh, outcomes of this principle. And uh, uh, Charles Darwin really suggested a scientific theory because it is based on a self-evident, uh, as he thought, principle. First principle is that all living things are, uh, um, uh, 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 first, they, uh, they have heredity. So that the progeny of uh, any organism is, uh, the, has the, uh, the features of uh, his parents. That is heredity. But he, the progeny of uh, uh, an animal, uh, the progeny of plant, is not identical uh, to, uh, to the parents. Uh, so the, uh, another principle is variability. And this variability, according to uh, Darwinian's uh, concept, are uh, f produced by chance variations. Now we call these chance variations as mutation. So the progeny has chance variations, and uh, uh, they may be inherited and transmitted uh, to uh, the progeny, these uh, chance variations from the parents. And there is a third uh, principle, uh, which is in fact Malthusian principle, and uh, Charles Darwin he himself says that the whole theory of evolution appeared uh, for him as a, uh, as, uh, as a uh, fit, uh, concise uh, whole when he got acknowledged with the Malthus uh, ideas. Uh, by the way, uh, Malthus was not a biologist at all, he was an economist. So according to, uh, um, to Malthus, uh, the, uh, uh, according to Malthus, uh, and uh, to this principle, all living things have striving uh, to increase in numbers, 
to multiply in geometrical progression. That is the driving force. It is not explained where uh, from this desire uh, comes. It simply is postulated that all living things, uh, things have tendency and desire to increase in numbers. But they increase in numbers under the deficiency of resources. So this, is, this limits the uh, opportunity for any living things to propagate uh, in, uh, in uh, tremendous quantity. And from this striving uh, to the utmost uh, to increase in numbers under the deficiency of resources cause, uh, results in struggle for life and natural selection. That means that the, it's not enough resources for all uh, progeny which appears from these parents. And only those who uh, have uh, chance variations or beneficial mutations can survive. And those who don't have these beneficial mutations or who do not fit to this particular environment, they uh, extinct. So uh, here is survival of the fittest. And those fittest, again, they have all these properties, variability, inheritance, and uh, uh, mm, uh, strive for uh, propagation in geometrical progression. And so this is just the, uh, the, the machine which uh, really works and according already to Darwin, which produces the highest, uh, uh, mm, uh, highest uh, result which can be imagined. Uh, so his, uh, the, his origin of species ends with such, uh, such, a, uh, such a claim. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most uh, exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. So this, uh, from this machine, uh, from this uh, theory, which I illustrated on the previous slide, uh, Darwin considers that the appearance of from uh, more simple, more primitive organism of the highest organism result from this struggle for life uh, due to propagation in, uh, in geometrical progression under the deficiency of resources. Unfortunately, uh, to uh, this theory, the last uh, uh, the last uh, postulate turned out uh, not to be the postulate at all. This is the phenomenon which is observed, but it is not the law, it is not the rule. Malthusian principle is sometimes is observed, but uh, uh, generally uh, there are some internal uh, restrictions for this multiplication of geometrical progression. Living things do not increase in numbers, because of deficiency of resources. They do not increase in, uh, in geometrical progression uh, because uh, to internal, some internal reasons which uh, need to be uh, discovered. Okay, uh, so that is the, uh, uh, this theory doesn't work in uh, such a way because one of the postulates is not a postulate at all. And as a matter of fact, what is the difference between neo-Darwinism and Darwin's theory? Neo-Darwinists, they acknowledged that the Malthusian principle really doesn't work. So they, uh, in Neo-Darwinist or uh, synthetic theory evolu uh, of evolution, this Malthusian principle is excluded. And what is left? Only two properties, the uh, inheritance and variability. And I don't, I, when I realized it, I stopped to understand how this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 partial uh, theory of Darwin can work uh, at all. But uh, does theory of Darwin work in a real uh, world? Does it work in nature, uh, what I described before? In fact, there are several examples. We can show several examples where Darwinian theory really works. And one of these examples is malignant tumor progression. So uh, any cells in our body uh, can multiply. And when they multiply, they, uh, their progeny inherit, of course, uh, some uh, the, the major features of, their, of the parent cell. And when they multiply, the, uh, the progeny is not identical to the, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the parent cell. So there is variability in multiplication also. But under normal condition, there is no strife for multiplication of our cells in our body and of cells in any animal for multiplication in geometrical progression at all. 
something stops, uh, for example, when we make a wound, then there is multiplication. When there is a normal condition, there is just substitution of dead cell for a live cell, there is no uh, tremendous multiplication. But under some conditions, there is, uh, there are, uh, at least it is considered, there may be mutations and cells begin to multiply under the, uh, according to Malthus, in geometrical progression, without restriction from the uh, organism as a whole. So uh, this uh, multiplication of cells uh, in geometrical progression under the natural deficiency of resources inside the organism results in the appearance of malignant tumor. So malignant tumor exactly appears in the organism according to Darwinian theory. But uh, nobody would say that uh, these tumor cells, which are in fact can be considered to be as fittest for this particular condition, that they are uh, higher in their uh, level than normal cells which perform uh, their, uh, which live for, uh, not only for them only, but for the organism as a whole. So this, but one can say, of course, but Darwin's uh, theory of evolution was not considered to be for cells in the organism. Uh, can we see in nature some other, uh, 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 some other examples uh, which uh, on the populational level, for example, and we can see uh, on, uh, in biology, uh, in, in, uh, on the population level, also examples of the realization of Darwin theory of evolution. That's, for example, are pathological population uh, waves, uh, which are very well known to humanity as the burst of locus, uh, which appear from nowhere uh, and very fast, uh, they increase in numbers tremendously and uh, so this, uh, the, the normal locusts are never absorbed uh, or absorbed only by biologists. They are so scarce, uh, but something uh, changes in the environment now. There are a lot of uh, uh, studies how this normal locust will transform into what was considered uh, uh, several decades ago into different species this locust, which uh, is uh, like a plug uh, for, uh, uh, for survival. Again, we have here the uh, development, or better to say, uh, uh, degradation, because this, uh, of course, uh, locusts uh, don't live uh, long. Uh, they multiply in tremendous quantities, and then they begin to fly uh, for unknown reason in one particular direction, uh, and whenever they fly, they get into ocean and uh, die there. So uh, there are examples of Darwinian theory of evolution, which really works. But now these examples I gave uh, to you as extreme examples. In fact, Darwin theory of evolution uh, is a theory of not gradation, not increase in organization but of de-differentiation, that is, decrease uh, in organization. Does it happen uh, with, uh, without such uh, uh, extreme pathological uh, effects? Yes, it very often happens. For example, our stem cells, uh, they uh, originate from more differentiated cells, and uh, the, uh, the degradation, uh, the uh, simplification uh, of uh, some cells, of some organism, is a necessary condition for further development, for increase in uh, organization. Okay, realization of Darwinian principle results in evolution, in degradation, rather than evolution, degradation, uh, development. So that is the first concept of evolution. Now uh, let's turn to the second concept of evolution. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck concept of evolution, which was suggested at the beginning of the 19th century, 50 years before uh, Darwin uh, theory was uh, published. So according to Lamarck, he postulates uh, one, uh, two important things. One important thing is that, that the plan followed by nature in producing animals clearly comprises a predominant prior cause. This cause endows animal life with power to make organization gradually more complex. Uh, Lamarck, in his, in his evolution theory, postulates that all living things has, uh, have internal trend to perfect, to become more perfect, to increase in their organization. 
and not only internal uh, total organization, but also in each individual apparatus when it comes uh, to be established uh, by animal life. So this progressive complication of organism was in effect accomplished by the said principle, principle cause in all existed animals. He postulates that there is such a inter natural law of increase in organization. And uh, why it, it, is, it, it was not a fear of evolution. It was a concept of evolution, because at the time when Lamarck uh, pronounced this uh, evolution, uh, uh, practically all, even biologists, they believed into what we call now creationism, that all species are created uh, in, uh, in such a way which we see them. Uh, Lamarck uh, suggested that all species were developing. According to Lamarck, uh, law forms uh, of life thanks to their internal activity, because they have trend to develop to, uh, to, to develop to higher level. In, in, and what is this internal activity? That is use and disuse of uh, their organs of their so they uh, adopt to their environment by use and disuse of their organs, and they transform into higher forms. Inheritance of these acquired characteristics provides for the progressive evolution. That is the inheritance of acquired characteristics. That is the second postulate of Lamarck. But he didn't devise this postulate. As a matter of fact, all biologists and Darwin also believed that uh, acquired characteristics during lifetime or the embryological uh, time uh, can be acquired. As a matter of fact, this uh, belief of Darwin, Darwin, as a matter of fact, was Lamarckist uh, in this, uh, that he also believed that use and disuse uh, results in variation, may result in variation, and these variations can be acquired. And uh, so, uh, according to Lamarck, the uh, species, all species, they evolve. And uh, th there is a question. Where from do we have now primitive species, not only higher level species, but primitive species as well? And Lamarck suggested a thing which was rejected later on by uh, biological science, that lower forms do not disappear because they constantly self-originate. Uh, contemporary biology uh, doesn't believe in self-origination. Contemporary biology believes that uh, everything originated some time ago, then evolved, and those who are primitive, they simply didn't change during this evolution. But we'll uh, see later that probably even this now heretical uh, idea of self-origination of primitive living forms of Lamarck, uh, it is uh, not, uh, it, is, uh, it may be substantiated. Uh, unlike uh, what we think uh, uh, of biology. Okay, this is a Lamarckian concept. Now, uh, let us uh, just uh, uh, summarize it. So, according to Lamarck, living things are active subjects. Uh, they directionally change, mutate in response to uh, environmental ch uh, challenges. Progressive evolution is a necessary natural phenomenon. That is the essence of Lamarck concept of evolution. And here is the essence of Darwinian concept of evolution. According to Darwin, living things are essentially passive objects. They stochastically change or mutate, and those who fit to environmental conditions survive. Their activity is reduced to uh, strive for multiplication. Internal activity of living things, they need to have this activity, and this activity is reduced only to strive for multiplication. So, Darwinian concept is that living things are passive objects. As a matter of fact, if, uh, of course, nobody uh, in biology uh, consider, will say that uh, he looks at living things as passive objects. So, uh, as a matter of fact, in biology now we uh, treat living things as machines. So, what is the machine? So, current paradigms. Uh, paradigm about living things. Living systems are essentially passive machines which are driven by external uh, forces. So this, is uh, this, this picture is taken from the typical text, uh, it is a typical biological textbook uh, 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 picture. Uh, how life on Earth uh, exists? It exists because there is high density, high quality light energy of the sun. Sun shines on Earth. And part of this high quality, high density uh, light energy is transformed due to photosynthesis 
into the chemical energy of organic molecules plus oxygen. And these organic molecules uh, are used as food uh, by, uh, together with oxygen uh, to produce energy in the form of ATP by animals. And uh, so that, uh, that, that drives their uh, uh, apparent uh, in, uh, internal activity. Uh, so they convert this organic molecule back into carbon dioxide and water, and so this uh, cycle rotates. That is a typical textbook. So why life on Earth exists? Because there is external drive for existence of life. Switch off this uh, 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 this machine, uh, uh, this uh, the source of energy, and life will disappear. So that uh, what follows from this. So life doesn't have internal energy. So this is a machine, a passive system, uh, so on, very complicated. Uh, inform information and energy and so on is processed in this machine, but. We can see a lot of examples where life can exist without this external source of energy. Uh, go to the bottom of the ocean, uh, 10 uh, kilometers uh, the, uh, below the surface of the ocean, there is abundant life there, but there is no sun at all, no sunlight. It is cold there, and uh, the uh, food is scarce there, but you can see big animals who uh, live there in this cold water, and they don't depend upon light. Go down into Earth, and whenever you go into Earth, deep into Earth, you'll see a lot of microbial populations there down into Earth, and they don't need also sunlight. So somehow they live under these conditions without uh, this uh, light. Usually, biological textbooks do not consider this extremal, uh, as they think, uh, the cases of a living, a living state. Now, uh, so we have two concepts of evolution. Darwinian, uh, which is passive, life is, uh, is a passive state, and uh, Lamarckian, that life is an active state. Uh, okay, uh, the, uh, uh, what happened in biology uh, after this for the, uh, the several decades? In biology, there appeared a, a real, uh, unknown to most biologists, a real theoretical biology. And there was such a scientist, Erwin Bauer, uh, who lived, uh, worked in Soviet Russia. Uh, he had a very dramatic, uh, d dramatic uh, fate. I uh, have no time to talk about him. Who published in 1935 the book uh, which was uh, entitled Theoretical uh, Biology. And this book uh, was, uh, he suggested theoretical biology, again, uh, based on fundamental principles or axioms on which he based this, his general theory of living matter. He suggested only three principles, three axioms, from which all the manifestations of life followed as the consequences. One of his major axioms, the, the major axiom was the principle of stable non-equilibrium. According to this principle, that is principle, that's axiom. All and only living sy systems are never at equilibrium. At the expense of their free energy, they ceaselessly perform work against equilibrium demanded by the physical and chemical laws appropriate to their external conditions. Even in plain words, living systems live because they persistently perform work to save a life. Whatever living systems are doing, they are doing in order to save a life that is they have internal source of activity, internal source of energy, and so this is the activity of living things. The Bauer's theoretical biology is based on internal activity of living things, Lamarckian as a matter of fact principle. On, uh, that is contrary to the uh, pa uh, attitude to living things as passive objects, because in fact, even a dead fish can go with the flow. It can also move, uh, the driven by, by the external force. Living things, they live because they have internal force. What, uh, uh, what uh, Bauer meant by this internal force? He, uh, he meant that stable non-equilibrium state is displayed at all the levels of a living system organization, including the molecular one. So what is the stable non-equilibrium state of, on the molecular level? It is an excited state. Uh, 
uh, the molecules may be in their ground state or they may be excited and when they are in excited state, when they return back to the ground state, they release energy which is free energy which can be used for performance of work. So all living, uh, 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 here is just an example of an excited state, for example laser state is an excited state of the matter. And laser in an excited state uh, may be considered uh, to be as the source of free energy, and it is really the source of free energy. But laser should be pumped. So all the work performed by a living system is produced at the expense of structural energy, energy of excited structural elements of the system. So according to uh, Bauer, living systems absorbed uh, were not pumped from outside by energy in order to transform into excited state. They absorbed the dissipated energy from outside, uh, converted it into high level energy and used this energy to perform all their living, uh, all their living uh, functions. And uh, uh, basing on these uh, principles, uh, uh, on these uh, principles, uh, principle of stable non-equilibrium, and uh, mm, uh, Bauer uh, suggested a version of Lamarckian uh, mm, uh, principle of evolution, principle of increasing of external uh, work performance, increase of a living system activity as a general trend. Uh, the theoretical biology of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, Erwin Bauer was refined and much more substantiated from a thermodynamical point of view, uh, realization of the Lamarckian principle of evolution. So uh, this uh, principle of uh, Erwin Bauer defines the vector of development of all living system on all levels of life. But what left uh, uh, not understood even by those uh, few biologists who were acquainted uh, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with uh, the theory of uh, uh, Erwin Bauer? Uh, so that, uh, what, uh, what was, uh, why uh, the biologists were cautious? Because uh, they were cautious because Bauer did not and could not at his time specify the nature of the living matter which is able to reside in a stable non-equilibrium state. We know that usually if you excite some matter, it will automatically go to a ground state and you cannot sustain it continuously in, in the excited state. State. So his postulate, which is just the result of multiple observations, was not substantiated by the physics uh, and chemistry of uh, uh, his uh, contemporary physics uh, uh, and chemistry. And Bauer uh, also uh, didn't suggest a convincing mechanism of conversion of low-grade chemical energy of food into high-grade structural energy, energy of excitation of living matter. So now we come to the question, what is the essence of living matter? Uh, when I teach my students uh, biochemistry or uh, bioorganic chemistry, I ask them, what are the major biological molecules? The uh, obvious answer is DNA, RNA, proteins, lipids, and so on and so forth. But let's look at some living things. For example, there is such a living thing which is called jellyfish. It consists, of course, it contains protein, DNA, uh, uh, lipids, uh, carbohydrates, and so on, but it consists on water on 99.9%. It is so uh, jellyfish may be considered as ultra pure water, and this ultra pure water is alive, it uh, has all the functions of a living system. So jellyfish is alive, and uh, you may call this live water, because even sea water in which this jellyfish resides is much more dirty than jellyfish water. Of course, if you extract from this jellyfish 0.1% of these impurities, it disapp life uh, disappears. So live water is 99.9% water plus 0.1% of something which make this water alive. So why water is so important for life? Uh, so we can talk about, uh, yes, of course, protein, nucleic acids and so on, they are necessary components of living systems. But water is even more necessary component of any living system. 
What are very special about water? Why it makes things can make things alive? Living things have energy. They have internal energy. They have their sources of energy. Where from living things get their energy? So the major source of free energy for all living systems is respiration. What is respiration? Let's uh, again uh, uh, turn to the to the uh, uh, scientist who first discovered this respiration. That's uh, Lavoisier, French uh, scientist Lavoisier. More than 200 years ago, he defined respiration as slow combustion of carbon and hydrogen, similar in every way uh, to that which takes place in lighted candle. That is, for, uh, for uh, Lavoisier, respiration was, uh, uh, was combustion, was burning. Uh, similar in every way uh, to what takes place in a lighted candle. And in this respect, breathing animals are active combustible uh, bodies that are burning and wasting away. Uh, of course, we uh, all um, uh, now know that uh, this uh, respiration is, uh, goes on in mitochondria. Uh, nobody uh, claims that respiration is burning, uh, according to Lavoisier. But was he wrong or was he right? What is combustion, in fact? What is burning? Burning is oxygen reduction with electrons, hydrogen, that may be accompanied with photon emission. That is the chemical definition of respiration. That is reduction of oxygen or oxidation of hydrogen. When they combine together, you get a, a flash of energy uh, of so high density that it may uh, you may look at this energy as energy of light from ultraviolet or even deep ultraviolet to visible uh, to, to visible light. Does combustion burning can it go in liquid this uh, uh, this uh, production of light? Can it proceed in living systems? Uh, just now I told that living systems are water. Uh, can combustion go in water? In fact, uh, the, it was discovered again uh, in the time of Lavoisier, more than 200 years ago, that combustion cannot go without water. And it was discovered by the, uh, uh, by the British uh, chemist, uh, woman uh, chemist, Elizabeth Fulheim, uh, in a book published in London in 1794, an essay on combustion, where she claimed or even proved it, that, for example, when you burn coal, so it is not direct uh, combination of oxygen and carbon. She discovered that uh, coal burning cannot go without traces of water. Water is necessary for burning of coal. And he uh, made such a conclusion that carbon attracts oxygen of water. Carbon is oxidized not by water, uh, by uh, oxygen of the air, but it is oxidized by uh, oxygen which belongs to water. Uh, it uh, attracts uh, oxygen molecules from uh, atoms from water and four hydrogen atoms are released. And these hydrogen atoms combine with oxygen molecules of air and convert again back into water. So if you don't have water here, oxygen of air will not combine to carbon. And uh, so it was her discovery first of uh, the um, catalytic prop uh, property of water. She discovered more than 200 uh, ago uh, the catalysis. Water is a catalysis, a catalysis for this uh, process. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, what she discovered, that it is not coal which is burning, it is water which is burning, because uh, oxygen of the air is reduced by hydrogen of water. So water catalyzes oxidation of coal, and water is burned in this process, converting back to water. So it was, this discovery was made 200 years ago, it was forgotten uh, very soon. Then uh, there was a rediscovery of the catalytic properties of water for burning uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, again by British chemists. Then again it was forgotten. And now, in fact, we again returned to the ability of water to burn. 
Several years ago, the uh, American inventor, uh, John Kanzius, uh, just demonstrated that if you treat water with radio waves of specific frequency, water split into oxygen and hydrogen, and you can ignite this water and you can see practically burning of water with your eyes. So water is uh, capable for burning. And water is the major uh, substance uh, in uh, any living body. But what is real water, which we have now? Real water is always a system, aquatic system. For example, in any real water, what, uh, just for example, which is standing here on this tray, you always will see at least another uh, uh, substance, which is uh, carbon dioxide or carbonates in general. They are always pre present in any real water. Uh, whatever water you take, water of living organisms, water of flows, water of uh, uh, biological water, uh, water of mist, it, uh, it is always a carbonated uh, water. And uh, what is the uh, general property of uh, carbonated water? Water always contains more or less carbonates. So uh, we have shown uh, some time ago that uh, the carbonates are the catalysts, uh, catalysts which are present in water. They are catalysts of water burning. Bicarbonates support stable long-term water, uh, water burning. For example, if you take this carbonated water, and you uh, add to this carbonated water uh, some uh, mm, induce a, a source of electrons, you can see a flash of light from this uh, carbonated water. If you add to this water uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is the source of uh, additional oxygen to this water, then these uh, hermetically closed bicarbonate solutions activated with only 10 thousandths of percent of hydrogen Carbo uh, hydrogen peroxide burned for many months, even in complete darkness. And I can show you now, for example, one of uh, many experiments which we, we performed when we took a test tube with this carbonated water to which, uh, or bicarbonated water, to which small quantity of hydrogen peroxide was added. Uh, in this particular example, on the October 14th, 2008, and here is photon emission, which was measured using sensitive photomultipliers, same as Fritz Pop was using in his laboratory. Here is photon emission from this test, test tube. Uh, you can observe it for here. We started it in uh, 2008, and here is several months passed, then the whole year 2009, uh, nine, uh, 2010. Uh, this water was still burning, sitting in this hermetically closed, uh, um, uh, closed uh, test tube. Uh, in fact, uh, it, uh, this burning of water could go in complete darkness. For example, if you take this test tube with this burning, burning water and put it into photomultiplier, you can see that here is the level of uh, burning for one week. And this burning of bicarbonate solution turned out to be very sensitive to subtle uh, influences, but specific influences from the environment. Uh, here uh, we compared the photon emission from one and the same sample during a week preceding moon eclipse and the week following moon eclipse. So this water was burning on the week from uh, the 2nd of February of uh, 2009 to the 7th of February of 2009, and on this week, we continued recording of the burning of this water. On this week, something happened with this uh, burning water, and it happened exactly at the beginning of the moon eclipse, which was full moon eclipse in Moscow. Uh, and exactly in the moment when moon eclipse started, the intensity of this burning of uh, bicarbonate water increased uh, at least uh, twofold. And though moon eclipse ended after two hours, this water stayed on this uh, increased uh, level of uh, mm, uh, uh, photon emission for two days more, then it returned back to original level, though uh, it had also, unlike the previous period of time, it, uh, as if it remembered that it was influenced by this, uh, uh, this cosmophysical uh, event, uh, so it uh, changed, is, uh, ch changed the pattern of its uh, burning.
and think that we, our internal water is also bicarbonate water. And bicarbonate water is water of all living things. Even, so we think that even if this water in a test tube reacted so, uh, so uh, in such a manner to this uh, cosmic event, our water could also somehow react to this, uh, to, 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 to this kind of events. So aqua bicarbonate system can reside in stable non-equilibrium state and serve a permanent source of free energy, photons. Uh, this uh, seem, uh, from the first sight, it seemed to violate the first law of thermodynamics, the law of uh, uh, the law uh, of um, uh, the, uh, the law of uh, where from energy is uh, taken, absorbed by this water, because it turned out into a bulb which uh, can shine, 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 and shine, where, where from this energy is taken. And now the new science of water, which is now emerging, can give the answer to this question. This new science of water, which is based on the theoretical uh, uh, the 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 theory of water of Emilio del Giudice and on experiments of uh, Gerald Pollock. Uh, they uh, uh, claim, and they, and Gerald Pollock experimentally has shown that uh, water, uh, which we have everywhere, is not one phase system. It is not just a homogeneous system in which uh, everything changes each millisecond, microsecond, 10 to the 9 second. That water uh, in every uh, real uh, aqua system consists at least of two phases. And General Pollock just experimentally has shown that for water phase adjacent to hydrophobic interfaces is different from bulk water in physical and chemical properties. You have here the uh, interface. This may be interface, a uh, water-air interface, water walls of a vessel interface, interface of water and protein molecular, interface of water and carbohydrate molecular, and near this interface, there is a thick layer of water which may be considered to be liquid, crystalline, quasi-polymeric and coherent water. And far from this interface, water is more chaotic. Uh, bulk water is chaotic. So we have two waters in one water and there is a lot of different gradients, uh, uh, gradients uh, between these two waters. What is the major property from the point of view of bioenergetics of this uh, interfacial water? The major property is that this water is charged negatively. It has excess of quasi-free electrons. On the other hand, the bulk water which is adjacent to this water is charged positively. It has uh, excess of protons in this water. So you have the potential difference between these two water. Electrons in interfacial water are in an excited state and slight impulses can make these electrons free. Uh, that's one property, very important. Another property, which is also no less important. Uh, this, if you irradiate this water with visible light, infrared light, uh, radio wave uh, pr probably also, uh, the, this re irradiation of this interfacial water doesn't destroy it. On the contrary, it makes it more thick. It increases its uh, electron, uh, uh, electron storage capacity. It becomes a more strong capacitor than water not ir irradiated. And as a matter of fact, all liquid water resides in the environmental conditions where there is enough infrared energy. In this room, it is enough infrared energy in order to organize uh, enough water to make it interfacial and to make it a source of electrons. Now we have this source of electrons. If there is source of electrons and if there is oxygen, which is in bulk water, dissolved in bulk water, you may add uh, the, the additional oxygen in the form of hydrogen peroxide, or this oxygen may be absorbed from the air, or this oxygen may appear due to water splitting into hydrogen and oxygen. Then this interfacial water may be a source of electrons, it is a reducer, and oxygen is acceptor of electrons, and what we have essentially, it is water burning. 
water burning is in fact the reduction of oxygen by electrons which are extracted from interfacial water and the result of this reaction is appearance again of water. Why water is unique from this point of view? Because when water burns, the product of water burning is again water and oxygen. That is the only substance which is, when, which is oxidized by oxygen and converts back into uh, the uh, initial regions. Uh, you cannot think of another substances when, which is burning and like uh, the, the uh, bird phoenix converts back into itself. So that is the major property of water. So the overall reaction, water, interfacial water, combines with oxygen and carbonates catalyze this water burning and the result is oxygen and water, bulk water plus free energy. So that is the realization of Bauer principle. We may consider this water as water in the, uh, in the excited, permanent or uh, stable state of excitation. This stable state of excitation, uh, uh, when it is just, uh, you, you give some impulse there and there are catalysts, this, is stru this structural energy uh, is converted into free energy. You have this bulk water. So, uh, electrons in the form of light, uh, the uh, water, uh, interfacial water shrinks uh, because bulk water, which is disorganized water, is produced due to this process. But because there is enough of radiation in the environment, uh, at least infrared radiation, it may be radio wave radiation, and so uh, and so on. Th there is a return back. We uh, have uh, return back again. This uh, uh, this interfacial water again. So water doesn't produce energy. It converts energy. Water is not the generator. Water is a transformer. Transformer of dissipated energy, which until now was considered to be completely useless energy of dissipation, uh, this, uh, useless heat. Uh, in fact, it is not useless. It is the source of high density energy, which uh, pumps uh, aqueous system. So aqueous systems are step up transformers. They transform waste in, uh, in uh, so to say, waste energy or warmth into high grade free energy. So low density energy is present everywhere where we have uh, liquid water. Because in order for water to be liquid, there should be enough energy in the environment. If it is not enough energy in the environment, water becomes ice and there is no life in this ice. And this uh, uh, jellyfish uh, is just the converter of this energy of warmth, which is uh, in the uh, water in which it swims, into energy, this particular species of jellyfish, into energy of light, because this particular jellyfish is uh, more uh, even bioluminescent. Of course, there are a lot of uh, biochemical mechanisms of conversion of this uh, energy of very cold warmth around this jellyfish into light. But uh, here you can see with your eyes the obvious conversion of energy of dissipation into high grade free energy of light. Now, if we have these uh, sources of high density energy, then, and uh, we have not only water and not only carbonate in water, but we have also other, soli uh, other uh, elements in water, such as, for example, uh, nitrogen. Then uh, carbonates, which are present in such aqueous systems, they don't not only catalyze water burning, but they transform into a lot of active particles. Uh, for example, such particles, such and so on, and that is already kind of organic. If nitrogen is present, it will be excited, ionized, and complex organic compounds, including polymers, will emerge in this water because water is intrinsically active and its activity rises up to high density energy of electronic excitation, of energy of ionization. And so the result of this uh, behavior of liquid water is that 
more and more hydrophilic surfaces emerge in this aqua system and its structural energy and workability increases. When you have these aqua systems, when you have this organized water in the sea of disorganized water and, uh, and uh, chemical substances which may be transformed into more and more, uh, more and more complex substances, including organic substances, then we see emergence already of not only organics, but after these organics there follows follows the condensation of these organics into uh, uh, cell-like uh, uh, cell, uh, -like, uh, entities. And in fact, uh, it turns out that not only uh, Bauer was right, but it turns out that Lamarck was right, who claimed that primitive living systems originate continuously uh, around us. Is there any experimental evidence of this claim of Lamarck that life continuously originates uh, under the conditions of Earth? There was such a, a scientist, great scientist, uh, Wilhelm Reich, who uh, made this discovery uh, before the World War II, uh, when he discovered that if he took aqua system, which contained only dead matter, then under particular conditions, especially under uh, very slight irradiation with uh, uh, external energy, in these aqua systems he could observe uh, origination of amoeba, uh, like uh, of, uh, of primitive, very primitive uh, life uh, forms. His discovery was rejected, and for other discoveries, unfortunately, like uh, Bauer, who, who, who disappeared in uh, Russian uh, concentration camps. He was, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, killed uh, by uh, Stalin system. Wilhelm Reich was killed by American system. And so his discovery of this origination of life is also practically unknown to uh, most uh, biology. So intrinsic activity of aqua system is the Lamarckian prime cause that endows animal life with the power to make organization gradually more complex and to bring incre increasing complexity and perfection. And before I would like to ask, thank you for uh, being so attentive to my talk. I would say that for me at least, these changes which we have now around us, changes of the world which uh, uh, surrounds us, if uh, these uh, changes follow and they should follow, the law of biological development, the laws of evolution, they would lead, lead to the higher level of organization, to perfection. But unfortunately, Lamarck, Lamarckian theory should be combined with Darwinian theory. And Darwinian theory says that gradual development, the gradation, cannot go without degradation. And that is our uh, will, and that is our knowledge of uh, how the world is uh, constructed around us in order to, uh, to uh, ease, to, to make not so uh, terrible and severe the, um, the necessary realization of Darwinian principles in, the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in our life. Uh, to, uh, to, to understand that they should uh, uh, happen, but to, to make them not so severe uh, if we know how to uh, behave. Uh, but in any case, I think that uh, Lamarckian uh, uh, principle of evolution will overcome. Thank you very much.